Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Construct Innovate webinar series on sustainability planning and construction. So this is the seventh webinar in the series, and today's topic is around heritage, culture, communities, and sustainability. My name is Jamie Goggins, and I'm co-director of um, Construct Innovate, which is Ireland's National Research Centre for Construction Technology and Innovation. Very lucky to have uh, three great speakers uh, today. Uh, so first up will be Helena McAllen, who is uh, going to talk to us about town planning and community engagement. Uh, then Nasa Cronin, Dr. Nasa Cronin, uh, will bring us through a presentation around sustainability, culture and climate change. And then uh, Dr. Julio Bras Williamson uh, will speak to us about meeting net zero targets, considering a diverse domestic built uh, heritage. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Helena uh, for the first presentation. Thanks, Helena. Welcome, everyone. And um, it's um, thanks very much to Jamie and Colm and the team for the invitation to share some of our our work and I suppose lessons learned from our working with communities and regeneration and revitalization of their towns and villages and communities. So, and I think it's a short enough session, I've given about 10 to 12 minutes. So I'm going to just talk about, I suppose, our general approach and the context in relation to a community and citizen engagement in um, town renewal and town regeneration um, type projects. And then maybe we'll referenced a couple of examples of work that we've been involved with and the processes there, as was very much in the context of uh, policies, particularly the town centre first policies. And um, we'll, so we'll be referring back to that through the, the um through the presentation. So um, first of all, the team, we are an architecture practice based in Galway City, um, and we do we have quite a bit of public realm work and we really enjoy in the engaging and working with communities and in, in to generate visions and implement and construct um, um, and deliver the projects required under uh, outlined in those visions. And we also do a lot of passive house and um, passive house um, type buildings that are mixture building types as well. Um, what what's the context? So I suppose we've seen um there's, I suppose, a significant need identified for investment and regeneration of our towns and villages in recent years. And um, I suppose this is a photograph on the left. It's a, pro a building in Hedford on the main street. And it's surrounded by, I don't know how many, maybe six other sites and buildings that are um, either vacant or underutilized at present. 19.7% um, of, of the commercial building stock in Hedford is vacant. Um, so that was um, identified last year in the Northwest Regional Assemblies. They did a, a vacancy and dereliction analysis and survey of the whole of the region. So Hedford was the second worst that the town I actually live or close to. So it's, this is my local town as such. So it's just highlighting, I suppose, and, and, and where, where, where the issues are and the need. Um, so what's what's the response from government in relation to this? So I suppose the town centre first policy was... Um, um, launched, um, I think, February of 2022. Um, and this set out, I suppose, a plan-led place-based approach um, that to solving the various complex issues in our towns and villages. Sorry, just one second. So to allow, to basically create communities and our town centers and viable environment and attractive um, places for people to live, work and visit. Um, while also functioning as it's the things that other needs to do in terms of the cultural recreation and the service and social needs of the towns and um, communities. Um, so these, I suppose, the town centre first tried to pull together a strategy to deal with the various challenges that our towns and villages are dealing with. Um, um, so that, I suppose, is quite a recent and we're starting to see the first of the town centre first plans being delivered in, in various towns across the country. I suppose in the broader context, we have the sustainable development goals. And I suppose in relation to that, there was, you know, the different targets relating to responsive, inclusive, participatory and representative decision making. So again, if we're you know, working in towns, in infrastructure, in public realm type projects, I suppose the, the public, how, how are the community, um, are the citizens engaging with that process and how are they factored in? How embedded are they in that pro process and the decision making around it? So I suppose there's different approaches and different um, degrees of citizen participation. Um, so Einstein um, prepared in the 1960s kind of prepared almost a ladder to help describe degrees of citizen participation. So going from 
what might be almost malevolent in terms of manipulation of therapy at the lower rungs of the of the um, degrees of participation right up to what might be seen as informing or kind of lip service type consulting and um, very light touch in terms of how you engage with communities when you're delivering in public realm or or any pro this is process and policy not just relating to public realm or planning related matters and then up to where the where the citizens of the or the community and the public are actively involved and have um I suppose empowered in relation to decision making. Um, so we have, I suppose, that builds on then a process identified in the uh, International Association for Participation, which sets out, I suppose, has built on the work of Arnstein's and her work, um, I suppose, trying to categorize public participation or engagement in processes. So again, it's kind of been streamlined into looking at informed consult involving the, uh, the public or the citizens collaborating and empowering. So again, Again, as we move through those categories, we see increased impact that the community can have or the citizens have on the decisions made. And this is particularly important when we're dealing with people's towns. You know, they're, they're, um, these, often these streets are their family homes or their, there's, um, you know, their culture, their identity. So again, how, what's, you know, increasing, and I suppose we, as a, an office here, we're trying to be, you know, involved and collaborate, even empower as much as we can within the briefs that we're given, or even question the briefs sometimes for our public realm projects to, um, to enhance the opportunity for that um, increased level of participation by the community in our, in, in the projects we're undertaking, particularly public realm. And um, something just to flag as well, that as in the framework that we're sitting in, so we have, um, at the second edition of this document was launched last week, a guide for inclusive community engagement in local authority and uh, local planning and decision making. So again, a really practical, very useful, helpful tool to, um, to guide in what's currently um, good practice and maybe and opportunities maybe for even enhanced um, engagement as well identified in that. So again, a useful reference document for anyone in the space or wanting to find out more. And on the right hand side, again, it fails on that diagram I showed in the previous slide. So again, the informing and the consulting. Informing is basically a decision to be made. Here's the story, which is not really where we want to be. I would think as design professionals now working with communities or impacting their towns. Consulting is quite light touch. In our work, we're looking at aiming for that, again, these lower, the involving, the collaborating, potentially even empowering, depending on the briefs available and um, the clients and um, um, how the process has been co-designed from the outset. So we'll look at a, a project or two and just to outline what this, you know, what some of this looks like for us or our experience of it. So in 2021, so two years ago, we were commissioned um, by Ennis Diamond Town Team, which is a collection of um, Ennis Town Town Team and Clare County Council with support from Clare Local Development Company and Leader to develop an enhancement strategy for Ennis Diamond and County Clare. So we were working with a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team on this. We had Jerry McManus, grade two conservation architect, John Ruddle, tourism consulting. Um, we had um, David McLaughlin, quantity surveying and Lipscomb traffic and transport, and James O'Donnell, the planning consultancy, and, and S. Hannafy, all, a lot of Galway based consultants on the team with us. So this project, the, the town team, the town team, um, I suppose Clare seemed to be in the kind of ahead of the curve in some ways, as in the um, Clare Local Development Company established a, a number of town teams as pilots a few years previous in different market towns within Ennis Diamond to increase, I suppose, the capacity of the town to support sustainable and coordinated approaches to the revitalization of, the, of these market towns within in County Clare. So our brief, as it was given, was comprised of three main strands, streetscape, public realm enhancement, identification of opportunity sites within the town, and a feasibility study in respect of Blakes and Lenans, the protective structures in the town centre, which you might recall from different media or commentary, and as it's on the bridge, and it's often a bottleneck in terms of traffic or coaches getting stuck, etc. So it's a bit of a nightmare from a traffic perspective, those particular, that junction where those buildings are sited. So um, the bro we started two years ago. So the context we were working in, Town Centre First Policy did not exist, had not been launched. So it launched about halfway through this process. See in the top right what we're talking about in terms of the political, the angst, the community's kind of concern around 
I suppose the challenges they had related, uh, regarding traffic in the town, particularly a couple of key bottlenecks within the town. At the time we started the project, the if you I don't know if you saw in the media reports relating to the Puka, which was a proposed sculpture for Ennis Diamond Town Centre, which um didn't exactly garner public favour within the community. And I suppose it was a breakdown in relation to the engagement and the process around that. So we're very conscious and sensitive of these issues as we started on our process with this project. And again, we're still trying to tiptoe around the public health and navigate through the COVID-19 restrictions, which are still very much live at the time of this project. In terms of the broader context, we have um, the, you know, the town itself. There's a lot of opportunity in a relief road, um, road is proposed with a new bridge to enable the um, pedestrianisation of the bridges. So solve, address some of those traffic issues that's currently a judicial review. With the West Clare Greenway, we have amalgamation of schools. We have huge tourism potential. It's kind of close to a lot of tourism hotspots, but hasn't maybe fully capitalised on this. And it's a vibrant time with, even as we went through this process, we could see some additional, I suppose, activity happening on the streets and buildings on the streets and some of them being reactivated, which was really positive to see. So a lot going on in terms of the broader context. So... I suppose in terms of this was this was called at the time and um, we tendered for the Ennis Diamond Enhancement Strategy and I suppose there's a number of different plans for our names for time revitalization plans. We have master plans, enhancement strategies, frameworks, action or vision plans. And um, I suppose the strategy that um, ended up uh, on reflection was very similar to the methodology and um, the methodology in our strategy and in the brief that we were given um, and as it evolved was very much aligned with the town centre first plan process. So it's focus on place making based on extensive um, process of analysis and collaboration with the community and key stakeholders are really key part of it with conceptualization prior and really meaningful engagement the whole way through the process. So this is all supported by a community and local authority un underpinned by a Ennis Time and Town team working in partnership with the local authority. So we have the community in at the decision making end of the um, public participation process we looked at in the earlier slides. Um, so, and a really strong, and that helps support a, a strong engagement process with the residents, the business owners, the building owners, um, property owners, even visitors um, and other community groups. I suppose that um, the empowerment of the community group as part of our client and, and the form of the town team, I think really strengthened the process here. So as part of the town, how did that aid the process, I suppose? So part of the, um, I suppose, the town centre first process would be about understanding the place. And um, so like analysis and appraisal of what's there. So we're looking at the streetscape, the urban form, the, the built um, heritage, the fabulous facades and shop fronts that we see in Ennis Diamond. And I suppose the delightful lanes and the kind of mystery and this, from an, uh, as an urban designer and analysing the public realm, it's a delight. There's so much potential in the, as you walk through the town. But you're also collecting things as part of that understanding of the place. How has the town evolved? It's morphology and um, I suppose mapping the extent of vacancy, the buildings at risk, the sad gaps in the streets that we see and the potential um, and the potential of some of the future voids. So we're trying to map and understand all of these issues. So a lot of layering and analysis of collecting of data, understanding that the commercial and cultural context of the town and the businesses and their challenges. Um, Another particular issue here is the understanding the socioeconomic profile. Can we target measures to areas that are more deprived within the town? Can we, you know, focus the, the key or help? Can that be, can we maximize the potential for key projects and investment in those areas which have more challenges? Um, again, traffic as in every town. So we're mapping and layering in all of these, um, I suppose, elements to try and understand the place. But some things are a little bit harder to understand in terms of. Um, what do the community value? What what uh, the people of this town? What is their identity? How do they feel about that? And this is where um, a community engagement or a public um, participation pr ongoing process that we found incredibly useful. So uh, part of the site were the Blakes and the Nan buildings, and we did two the two ladies that owned the properties here having a chat and an old photograph. Um, but as part of the, our engagement process, we kind of gathered um, the communities, I suppose, try to capture the collective memory of these buildings. They've, you know, they've been, um, um, they're, they're seen as a often as a negative at the moment, given the traffic and the other issues around that particular junction. 
So again, um, by looking back and understanding more that I suppose, yeah, that what the community, the the, the cultural, the socio, um, the history of those particular buildings and maybe gives a much better understanding and also help identify what, what the community felt was special about it and what we should try and retain or what they would like to see happen there as well as part of that engagement process. Um, another element that's really can be challenging to gather in mapping is, I suppose, the, there's events and things, particularly in public space, there are things that are kind of ephemeral or um, temporary in nature. So understanding, you know, the traditions in like this, it's St. John Knight's bonfire, exactly where it happens, the fairs, the poetry, there's a lot of intangible, um, I suppose, culture that's a little bit, you know, you need a really, like I suppose it's much easier to understand that or have some aware or better awareness of it through, I suppose, really good community engagement as you go through, um, as we go through developing a strategies or trying to decide what might be right or work through with the community as to what might be right for their town or their key public spaces. So we were lucky in the sense that from a collaboration communi communication perspective, we were we we had help. There's an exceptional level of cooperation and partners, genuine partnership between the town team and the council, the steering um, committee, uh, the steering group um, representatives from Clare County Council. I've, you know, seldom in a project have seen such a high level of trust within that team. And then that the access and the depth of local knowledge that affords us as, as, as a design team is really was invaluable to this process. Um, and this, if this, I suppose the town centre first policy um, 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 proposes that, that that would be a similar process. We love town teams, a collection of in, um, residents, building owners, community groups, and, um, uh, business owners, sorry, um, and other key stakeholders in the town coming together as a town team to work with um, the local authority, a partner in the delivery of you know, designing the master plan or the future for their town. I suppose if the, our experience of this, if this level of partnership and effective, if this is a prototype as to how the town centre first town teams are working, it's, it, you know, I suppose it, our experience is that there's such huge potential in it and, um, and I suppose a lot of benefit to be had for everyone involved through that process. We also had three, we had, I suppose, three rounds of public consultation on this. And I suppose we went out to the community from the outset to set out our, um, um, at, at the outset, I suppose, to gather their thoughts, even to inform our brief before we um, started to look at any interventions in the spaces, which I think is, you know, we've, it's something we even we've added to other projects, an extra round of public engagement to be, get in early and get the, um, the, the be clear that we've properly identified the needs and the ideas of the community before a pen is lifted in terms of um, um, any design or um, development of proposals for a town. Again, the young people too, um, risk that some of the engagement with younger people can be seen as tokenistic and I suppose we, our own process is that they're audited and they're mapped and the data collected as it would be with any other form of um, consultation feedback and material and you, you'll find um, if you engage in this wholeheartedly um, you know there's a lot to be learned that um, enriches the process and sees things in a different from a different perspective so again the schools and engaging with young people very important if you can through the process. So all of this collaboration and communication, the strategy is very long. I can't go through, I'm probably over time already. So I can't go through all of the type of projects, but the, the feedback and the analysis directly informed the identification of things like the opportunity sites in the town, um, even um, and a series of key projects, in addition to identifying the kind, helping to identify the uses and the public's relationship and level of access to the Blakes and Lanans building, which very much influenced the concept um, um, for that redevelopment of that building also. So again, we're looking at, we also use, just to note, we use the One Planet Living Framework by, by a regional to maximize the opportunities to support um, sustainability and biodiversity. And so that's embedded in the strategy just to try harder to maximize the wins or outcomes. Um, so we have a series of key projects, again, um, so um, looking at different design interventions and responses to try and basically create this, you know, maximize the opportunities for the town and um, to, you know, make it as vibrant and as livable and as walkable um, and uh, dwellable as possible and um, through the process, encouraging footfall, finding solutions to parking, uh, obviously, obviously, obviously a significant issue in any town, um, town or, or, or public realm work. 
Um, so we found, I suppose, a, you know, a series of protests, and it's great to see some of these already moving forward. Um, um, so just to kind of note, when we're looking at those, identifying those projects, we asked, what would you like to happen first? What would you like to see here first? And the, and the briefs for each of the key spaces in the town were very much driven, literally driven by the feedback that came through from that. So uh, the feedback from the, the 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 various all of the community, the business owners, the um, community groups, the residents directly fed into the briefs that were developed for the key projects in the key spaces within the town. And again, some samples of the strategies it proposed. Again, similarly with lakes and lands, living in the shop was the 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 strategy. In, at the end, or you know, the recommendation from the feasibility here, and again, providing access to the allowing the community were keen to have access to the space behind, so the courtyard space behind, and how that's designed as publicly accessible, and with activities adjoining it that enable the activation of that courtyard space to the back, all directly derived from the feedback through the consultation processes. So where is it at now? Um, so one of the key projects to enable the, street, the works of the street is the creation of a new car park to allow us to reallocate um, space within the town centre and footpaths back to um, pedestrians. So in more sustainable modes. So we have part eight. Um, so the part eight process for Monastery Lane Car Park with construction hoping to commence next year. Currently, we're working on town and village renewal. They've received funding for to move three projects, one to construction and two to detailed design of the three key projects. And again, public consultation feedback was very strong in the need for public toilets, which are currently under construction. So I suppose a lot has been achieved in, the, I suppose, a year since um, the completion of the strategy. I don't know if we have time for another quick one, or do I, Jim? You might let me know. Uh, yeah, maybe two more minutes or so. Just, just a different scale and a different way of working with communities. So uh, uh, this happened earlier. Well, it happened in August and culminated about three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago. It's, it's the heart of Hedford Project. So this was, um, I suppose, tactical urbanism, which I, but I mean by that, uh, a pop-up temporary measure in a public space um, to test and to challenge the use of that space and to help inform, you know, um, I suppose, momentum and test uh, regeneration proposals or possibilities, design possibilities for that space. So this builds on work, um, this, um, this project builds on the work of Reimagine Hedford, which was um, an Irish Architecture Foundation project where Deirdre Graney, an architect based in Sligo and um, um, uh, had worked with the town team in Hedford. I'm a member of the town team in Hedford to um, develop up a strategy to help, I suppose, reactivate our town centre, um, which is kind of a little bit sad, as I've mentioned earlier, in terms of its vacancy, um, et cetera. So um, that project was launched by the Taoiseach. The project themes from that process were launched by the Taoiseach in August in Hedford, in a vacant building in Hedford. So since then, Architecture at the Edge and Something in the Water Festival, um, our company and Presentation College Hedford worked together to create this temporary installation. So it was a co-design process based on the findings from the Reimagine Hedford project with the community um, 400 and something people responded to a survey and more people engaged in various events through um, our engagement process over a period of about six months to um, I suppose share what they would like to see happen in the town center of Hedford. And in particular, this project that looked at the square. So um, we have an area in the square um, and we set to work with the students at Presentation College Hedford. So a series of design workshops capturing the kind of what they would like to see in that space, some of the forms and um, through model making, through collage, through drawing, a series of design proposals were developed to create this temporary structure, which reflected their ideas for the future design use and activation of the square in the town. I suppose in the hope that the project would further highlight the the need for more spaces for young people living in Hedford and kind of test and demonstrate um, the public realm improvements that are required or could allow the town and the main street of Hedford to thrive and be much more livable and inviting. So here's the students a few weeks back and um, building their, well, informally called, it's the heart of Hedford slash the busk box. So it became um, over the period of the festival um, weekend, there was a space in which the community could congregate within this um, a place for dwelling, for rest, for chatting, for meeting people. Um, I designed um, very much based on the students' ideas, 
in collaboration with Hedford Men's Shed, who helped deliver the project, and um, the Hedford Lace Project, who overlaid and provided additional workshops also. Um, so this was community build, so we can see the space in use. So this is, I suppose, a different approach in terms of working with communities hands-on to deliver um, um, to test, um, uh, I suppose, design out options and strategies. Again, to do this kind of thing, we need a lot of, we need, sorry, we need, I suppose, a lot of support on the ground, a lot of community support to help deliver projects of this nature. But we're very lucky with the Conroy Group, Architecture at the Edge, McGraths and Colin you know, um, as key sponsors to help actually build the structure, which is demountable, designed in panelized, so it can come up and down as needed with it's a um, final home to be in Presentation College, Hedford. Um, so this was our big build. So testing, and again, just emphasizing the, the support, the you know, really close engagement and support of the community in that co-design um, to deliver projects of, co of that nature, co-designed. So where kind of a few takeaways. When you're looking at public engagement or working with communities, clarify the purpose and the scope. You know, how, how, how rich or how deep is your public engagement? Will it be in form or consult? I would hope not. And you're looking to can you involve and collaborate and empower? So um how you know how deep can the um engagement of the pro what how deep can the degree of, of participation be? Be a conversation, not just a one-off survey. So if you're working with a the community, these projects take, take take maybe six, nine, so occasionally 12 months. So again, there's that ongoing conversation of feeding back to people and um, again, the process not just an event. Um, I suppose a key part of this is co-designing the engagement plan and the process and questioning the briefs because we sometimes they come in and they, the briefs from maybe a local authority looking at public realm work and they mightn't have an initial round of listening to the community and it's just can you embed that in the process it'll make life a lot easier if you've heard you know the the needs and the ideas maybe directly unless you're fortunate enough that the brief has already undertaken a round of that in advance of your involvement in the project Recognize the importance of, um, of personal relationships and those one-to-one -one conversations. Um, um, be active in your listening, write it down, let people see that you're listening, you're taking it in. I think it's very helpful. I suppose all of this ends up that we can, like we find in a, helping to build trust through ongoing engagement and involvement, which is really needed for sometimes not all conversations are easy and there needs to be a level of trust, um, particularly when there's maybe difference of opinion or challenges within the projects. Well, that's um. Anyway, that's some of our kind of what we've learned or um our experience in recent years in relation to working with communities. Oh, brilliant, thanks, Helena. Um, so if anyone has any questions on that, we're going to save all the questions to the end, so you can type them into the Q and A uh, in there. So you'll see the Q and A box up on Zoom there, and you can type them in. So I'll, without uh, any further delay, we'll pass over to Nessa Cronin, uh, who's going to uh, do her presentation. Thanks, Nessa. Great. Uh, thanks a million, Jamie. And uh, thanks, Sinead, as well, for the invitation and also uh, to Helena for kicking us off today um, for what I think will be a really interesting discussion about all of these um, areas. Uh, so um, I'm going to do something just slightly a little bit different, um, but picking up on some of the themes, I suppose, really that Helena touched on, uh, particularly in relation to the question of values that people have in relation to places in Ireland, um, both in relation to the built and the natural and, um, environment and heritages in particular, um, and the idea of place attachment. Um, what happens when it's undervalued or ignored and also how are we going to deal with this, I suppose, with the challenges of the 21st century in particular to do with climate change. Um, so uh, I'm going to focus really, I'm going to, kind of the two or three things I'm going to do today. I have a lot of information on the slides. I know that Jamie will be circulating them afterwards. Um, so I, the information is there for you to explore any of these topics in more detail afterwards yourselves, if it touches on any area of your own work in particular. And I'll also be delighted to take any questions at the end or emails um, afterwards as well too. Um, so I'm going to look at kind of five, four or five key concepts that I think we need to be mindful of when we're thinking about people, places and communities in the contemporary environment, but also in, in terms of thinking about where we need to go in the next 10, 20 and 30 years uh, with the challenges of, of climate change and sustainability. Um, and I'm going to focus it really on the idea of um, an ocean world 
um, because over 40% of the Irish population lives within five kilometres of the coastline. Um, I'm living and working in Galway and we have our own particular challenges around managing coastlines in terms of people and heritage and place as well, as I'm sure many of you experience as well across the island of Ireland. Um, so I'm going to move between Galway and Greenland as well, just as a reminder that we are an island nation. Um, and so what's affecting us is affecting other places and we can learn from other experiences as well, too. Um, but first, I suppose, just to situate my, your, myself for you, um, I am uh, an Irish Studies scholar um, focused really on the interconnections between landscape and, and literature. Um, but in recent years, my work has kind of turned to look at the question of the cultural experience of living in the Anthropocene and how communities in Ireland are engaging with that in different ways and how that's represented in cultural forms in particular. Um, so part of my other role as well is with the Irish Humanities Alliance. Um, so we organised a webinar um, as a post-COP26 roundtable discussion uh, a couple of years ago when it was held in Glasgow and uh, because we identified that the arts and humanities and the particular perspectives brought from that side of the table was not really part of an overall conversation about climate change and communities and um, that the solutions were often seen or still often seen to be very STEM driven engineering driven and geoengineering is a term I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, and also in terms of uh, technologies in terms of mitigation and adaptation and what we wanted to really foreground was that people live in places they're attached to places as Helena said some of these their homes maybe also their businesses in particular in terms of farming uh, and agricultural uh, heritage in Ireland and fishing as well um, and that we need to understand this very intricate relationship and the value systems attached to place attachment if we're going to help everyone to kind of move together to address uh, these challenges going forward. Forward. Um, so some of you might have come across this image. Um, it was uh, an image that kind of went viral in 2019. And it was uh, an, an image taken from uh, melting sea ice up in Greenland uh, when it was um, it, the Danish uh, Meteorological Institute were conducting surveys, but there was unprecedented there was unprecedented heat wave um, at the time, um, and they were at risk of losing over half a million euros worth of instruments out in the sea ice. The skidoos that they had uh, were too heavy to go out, so they had to rely on what we call traditional ecological knowledge. Um, of the local communities um, for people to be able to read the water and the melting ice. Um, so they went out in more traditional uh, dogs and sleds and rescued um, both the scientists and uh, the instruments as well uh, came safely back to more terra firma. But this brings up a question about identity and climate change, also the practicalities of it, but also cultural heritage, particularly for communities where their heritage and their identity is so deeply embedded in the landscape, in the built environment and the natural environment around them. So when that's changing or undergoing transition, um, how do we take that into account? Um, and as one elder from that community said, the Inuit are people of the sea ice. If there is no more sea ice, how can we be people of the sea ice? Um, so one person who's been kind of navigating this and trying to figure out ways how to think about this in different perspectives is uh, the scholar Kenneth McLeod from Australia. And in 2018, he set out a position paper about learning to think like a planet. Um, and it became a really important uh, paper in uh, social sciences and environmental humanities in particular, because it set out kind of key questions that we need to think about. Uh, and now, you know, five years later, we're still returning to these questions, obviously, uh, at the moment as well. Um, he spoke about the, the need for cathedral thinking, and this is kind of long term ideas about planning uh, that is multi-generational and the architects in the room are very familiar with this uh, as well as I'm sure many of the, the engineers as well too. And of course, only a year later, uh, we would see actually a cathedral being burnt down, Notre Dame in the image here on your right, um, where again, discussions about the need for cathedral thinking um, and long-term visions for Europe and sustainability was very much to the fore at the beginnings of the realization of the impact of the climate crisis on the continent as well. He also says that we need to think about the Anthropocene transition for communities um, and also to think about this in a generational way. And he says he, he kind of finishes up in short, we must do today. What must we do today to earn the title of worthy ancestors? Um, so this idea of uh, social justice and generational justice and environmental justice, not just for the present generation, but for the generations uh, to come. 
Um, and in uh, the Northern uh, Territories in uh, in Canada, in particular with Inuit communities in Alaska and Nunavut, they are on the front line of this, as many other coastal communities are internationally. Um, and a, a writer who has talked about this is uh, the Scottish writer Kathleen Jamie, who's conducted uh, surveys and studies on this between Scotland and, uh, and uh, Canada as well. And she takes uh, a report from uh, a local woman who says they're moving my house soon. The land is eroding so fast. I come out here in the morning in my robe with a coffee, but every time more is gone. The next full uh, full moon tides, I think all this chunk of gone we're standing on will be gone. And she finishes up by saying that the land is losing its grip on itself. Um, so looking at what is the role of culture, what's the impact of this for communities and what role can culture and cultural heritage play in rethinking this transition to, uh, to new spaces and places in the 21st century. So in Ireland, of course, we've had our own um, controversies and discussions and debates about this in one degree or another. The most recent one and more, one that's more uh, prominent in the west of Ireland is the, the Shell to Sea campaign uh, in Bale Boy up in County Mayo. Um, but what's interesting about this is one aspect of it that's less well known was the, uh, the aspect of not just obviously the culture or the, the uh, environmental impact on the local community, but it was also about the cultural impact as well in terms of the changing nature of the place, of the fabric of the community itself, and also for the generations to come. Uh, B. Hall O'Shine, who was a, a key person involved in the local community there, he says here, um, our attachment to place comes into it too. And he says, this idea of culture is not something that you buy in, an, in a Sunday newspaper. He says, for us, the cultural aspect was very simple. When people talk about culture, it's the page and the times that no one reads or the Sunday newspaper. But for us, it's a different thing. It's all of living everyday survival. Um, and for him in particular and other members of the community it was also about the Irish language, it was also about uh, the local environmental impact on fishing and farming in the local areas, and also the change to the land use uh, that had been there for generations, and they were thinking of the generations to come and how that was going to change as well too. And um, so we can look to other forms of cultural heritage and other ways in which communities have sustained uh, policy and planning in different ways, in particular from Indigenous communities. Um, and the seventh generational principle is something that you might come across uh, more and more in a lot of this, the, the kind of the critical literature now. Um, it's from primarily from the Iroquois uh, communities in, uh, in North America. And it's the idea that the decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. Um, and it is kind of an ecological sense of sustainability before these words were even termed uh, over the generations. Um, it's referred to decisions being made about energy, water, natural resources, ensuring the decisions are sustainable into the future. Every decision that's made now has to be thought of about what the impact will be seven generations in the future. So when we think about sustainable development, we often think of the three key pillars that are noted, social, environmental and economic. Um, but in more recent years, uh, people have begun to question that if the science and the data is in, in terms of planning and policy, why is it not, why is it so slow and why um, are, is there reluctance to engage in different areas or why are there problems there as well? And so Alison Tickle, who is the CEO of a, an, an NGO uh, in Julie's Bicycle, which helps cultural organizations um, and institutions to move to net zero transition, She's argued um, at the COP meeting in Glasgow that no amount of data, science or technology can ever make us feel the world in the same way as art can. So this is the argument, I suppose, really about why we need to take art and culture seriously uh, in terms of looking at what is the role and function of it um, and how we can mobilize it as a tool as well, both to engage with communities, to uh, listen to concerns with communities, but also to help communities and society to reimagine a better future for all. So culture was ratified as a fourth pillar of sustainable development as a key infrastructure in 2010 um, uh, with the, the, Cong, the World Congress of the UCLG held in Mexico. Um, it's been more recently um, associated with the Culture uh, Europe um, organization as well as the fourth pillar of sustainable development. And it's slowly kind of wending its way through the SDGs as well too in different ways. Um, but it has a little bit to catch up with in terms of uh, policy and, and uh, platform in many ways. 
So why why is culture important and why why should we need to think about it in different ways? Um, there was the London School of Economics issued a, a blog and a report um, in 2021 that said without social sciences, humanities and arts, the goal of sustainability may never be reached um, because it's the areas of the humanities and the arts in particular that hit in on ideas of cultural value and what people have or what makes value for people in their local communities and national cultures as well too. And they've also argued that culture uh, is needed to understand and address the drivers of cultural and social change so that we need to understand what motivates people in terms of whether it's uh, questions and debates around um, seaweed gathering or about uh, turf cutting or about um, wood stove burners or whatever it is. Uh, there are different cultural associations in different countries attached to local landscapes and the built environment as well, too. We have culturally specific attachments to places, spaces and resources, whether it's the west coast of the US, the forests and woodland culture in Germany, and of course the boglands in Ireland and Denmark as well. And UNESCO have also flagged the importance of tangible and intangible cultural heritage. And I think Helena mentioned that as well, too, that if it's invisible, sometimes it's almost seen as if it's not there. Um, but that definitely should be a red flag. If it's invisible, it's there somehow. Um, but we need to make it more visible and, and also to understand this might be an invisible driver for a change in a community or resistance to, in a community uh, in other ways as well, too. Um, these are just links for anyone who's interested on some really interesting uh, films that have evolved in recent times between Scotland, Ireland and Greenland around the idea of coasts and cultural, cultural communities and climate change. So I'll just leave the links up there and you can click on them and enjoy them over a cup of coffee someday uh, as well too. Um, but back to Galway, uh, one project that really kind of viscerally engaged with this, with uh, what we call site-specific um, artwork and socially engaged artwork, was a project for the European uh, uh, Galway Capital of Culture project in 2020, when Rena Nail and Joe Lee got a major commission to do a drowned Galway uh, project. And it was about imagining what Galway might look like underwater in the future in 2020. They worked with local communities, with school children, and with um, local activist organizations as well, uh, to try to imagine the present day Galway, but also Galway underwater as well. So they did a series of photo montages to, and they were placed in different places around Galway. Um, this here is down by, uh, by Salt Hill. The image here is the long walk um, and it's kind of picturing Galway under a tsunami uh, storm surge. And then the, the image at the below then is um, that storm surge coming through across to Galway Cathedral. So they were using images and photography, but then putting up these posters around um, site specific places in Galway City for people to actually engage with and to think about the built environment, the heritage and history of flooding in Galway City, uh, which we know uh, is ongoing to this day. So these are just more images here of some of these images that they had placed around the town. Uh, more recently, then, we've had the Lint and the Farragut Art Project, and that visualised, again, the seawater rising uh, around the Spanish Arch area um, and linked in, again, with uh, local communities and schools um, and the Galway City Museum to foreground uh, the, what the rising levels of seawater rise will have and the impact it will have in terms of the built environment and also the communities as well. They developed and devised uh, bilingual information on this and also kind of uh, workshops and tools uh, for people to work with in their communities as well. Um, and of course, this is the UN Ocean Decade, uh, 2020s to 2030. And again, uh, foregrounding the idea of the need to connect people to the ocean, which is known as our life support system. Um, and this has been uh, flagged by the World Economic Forum. And again, McLeod again argues that culture is civilization's shared way of making sense of the world, of what is real, what is knowable, what is value. It conditions our way of being, seeing, doing, and imagining. It determines what we consider appropriate action in and on the world. So if we're ignoring culture in a particular way, uh, we're ignoring what's really um, at heart to what's of value to a lot of people and what motivates people in their actions as well too. So this is the final slide. Um, so these are just kind of the, the, the key points and takeaways that you might like to consider and think about um, in terms of thinking about these ideas further. Um, the McLeod article is a, a bigger article encouraging us to think like a planet in terms of not just about 
place and people in a specific place, but the impact of what we do here has an impact on a wider global sense and vice versa. Think about our responsibility to future generations, about worthy ancestors, thinking about the need for cathedral thinking, so long-term thinking and long-term planning uh, within obviously government and short-term uh, spaces can be a challenge. Thinking of seventh generation thinking, what we can learn from indigenous practices uh, internationally. And then again, recognizing that culture is the fourth pillar of sustainability, and that culture is an important way for people to make sense of the world and also that informs how people value their place uh, in the world as well too. So I'll leave it there uh, for that for the moment, Jamie, and uh, we can, I'll be happy to take more questions at the end. Brilliant, Tessa. Okay, very good, thank you. And we're on to our third speaker now. So as I said, if you have any um, questions, uh, put them into the Q&A um, tab in the bottom. So uh, on to our third speaker today. So Dr. Julio, uh, Julio uh, Bras Williamson from the University of Edinburgh. So over to you, Julio. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for, for the invitation to talk today. Um, and um, and really have this opportunity to 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 kind of talk a bit about the work we're doing, um, and and how the work has this value towards the heritage um, and 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 kind of culture of of, of cities. Uh, um, mainly talking about some of the work we're doing in Scotland. Um, I am part of the School of Engineering at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm a lecturer and Chancellor's Fellow in Net Zero Buildings. So I'll be talking about maybe some more kind of technical aspects about buildings um, and their role, the existing buildings and the role um, of uh, meeting some of the, the Net Zero targets that we have um, in both in, in the UK and Scotland and, and, and kind of throughout um, in Europe. Um, but looking at, at an important approach that we're developing in terms of tackling some some of the common types of building. Um, so so hoping to to, to kind of uh, bring this back to to the importance of of maintaining and, and keeping our our buildings uh, and, and I mean some of the previous speakers talking about the importance of that, that kind of built heritage. Um, and how occupants and 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 towns uh, and, and and users of buildings have, play a big role around um, the use of these buildings and, and maintaining the heritage of them. Um, so just a kind of brief overview. Um, I um, I'll have a kind of brief introduction. Also talking about some of the net zero and uh, targets that we have um, and, and and the role of, of existing homes in, in Scotland. There's certainly some challenges there um, that we are trying to, to 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 maybe address and 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 work with different stakeholders. Also talking about some of the past work that we're doing um, and how measuring and obtaining data is is, is quite important um, in, in recognizing the, the performance of buildings. Um, and then a, a kind of brief explanation of the work that we're doing around archetypes um, and selecting uh, and, and grouping uh, buildings uh, and homes um, to deliver retrofit options and, and to, to meet these net zero targets. And, and I'll kind of briefly, if I've got time, talk about some of the current projects that we have on board that are relevant to this kind of net zero journey that, that we're working on. So as a means of introduction, um, I'm part of uh, the Institute of, for Infrastructure and Environment, um, and um, and we deliver a lot of work around civil and environmental engineering um, within teaching and and research and 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 consultancy. Um, we have a series of, of kind of PhD students working around around these these topics, um, and uh, we're we're kind of working towards developing a net zero accelerator center. Which really just brings a lot of the the, the work that we're doing and and grows from it um, in terms of projects and and funding, um, together with work from uh, Professor Son Smith, who's probably already given a talk uh, in the past couple of weeks, um, and um, trying to kind of implement the net zero um, uh, kind of agenda and 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 technical methods um, for uh, for meeting these these targets uh, in existing buildings. So we're working very closely with um, lots of stakeholders and, and companies um, and um, and funders as well, 
we work with the Scot uh, with uh, the Forestry Commission, with uh, groups around uh, the EU, uh, with some UK presence like Scenario Labs and the more digital analysis of buildings, um, insulation kind of companies looking at developing different uh, materials, etc. And obviously trying to uh, link that in with uh, the funding available uh, through UKRI, the, the, our kind of research uh, in, uh, bodies, um, and also some of the Horizon Europe uh, projects that we were, were able to, to kind of collaborate in. So a great deal of what we're talking about really feeds into, into the work that we're developing uh, and, and how we were supported through that. So, so that kind of ongoing uh, issue around um, the work that we're we're developing. Um, it's uh, it's how do we really look into the value of buildings and how retrofitting these uh, is 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 vitally important. Um, and and really recognizing the value of our existing buildings. But but obviously there's different elements that that uh, concern us. Um, and and one of them is really how do we do we show. Um, the, the best ways to, to retrofit these buildings. And it's been very clear to us that a lot of industry and, and uh, building owners and, and, and certainly larger stock managers of, of housing um, say that there's a lack of, of, of clear and centralized kind of mutual advice on how to retrofit these buildings. Um, there are some areas uh, that, that have some interesting case studies, but, but it's not that well communicated to, to, to a whole range of people. Um, a lot of them are um, kind of not that clear in, in, in its way that's presented. Um, so we're looking to, to look at uh, having a kind of a transparent and maybe technically va validated uh, set of solutions that, that can be taken up by all levels of, of building owners um, and have that direct uh, interaction with the people that are going to deliver the work, uh, for example, building contractors um, and some of the, the kind of uh, property owners, um, and really have that, that kind of tra transparent approach um, in, the, in, the, in that uh, element of, of uh, technical delivery of, of, of retrofit of buildings. But I think we need to also build upon the, the existing work that's out there, um, and a lot of work by uh, whether it's uh, the architectural community, engineering community, uh, academia, etc. Et There's a great deal of exemplar projects out there that could, we could learn from uh, very easily, and also a lot of government reporting and and best practice approaches that, that could be taken up. Um, and not just in the Scottish context, I think there's there's a lot of good work um, in, in in all the areas uh, and, and and close to us as well. Um, so there needs to be these solutions that address not just the building envelope. Um, but also looking into climate change uh, kind of resilience in, in the delivery of these of these of this work, something that is not just a solution now, but it can definitely go forward uh, into into other uh, into into the, the future, um, and definitely looking into low carbon heating solutions as 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 uh, as, as an additional uh, element uh, to to that. So currently in Scotland. Um, and and the rest of the UK, we've got a set of, of targets. Some of them differ in, in, in different capacity, but a very ambitious target here in, in the central belt of Scotland uh, between Edinburgh and Glasgow. There's a kind of rivalry there of who's going to reach net zero before. Um, there's set targets of 2030, 2035 um, to, to meet that. Very ambitious uh, in its nature. Um, but Scotland in its own, is looking for 2045 as, as that kind of uh, set uh, net zero target, and and the rest of of uh, of, of UK and, and and the EU is around the 2050, which really matches a lot of the uh, other countries uh, in the world. But our big kind of problem is addressing um, our housing um, and built environment and and how that plays a part in in, in emissions. 14% of it is is emitted by housing. Transport uh, obviously has, has a big role there as well, um, and there's big conversations around how do we do we lower that and whether electric vehicles is a solution, things like that. But one of the problems that we have is existing homes and the role they play. Um, and certainly in Scotland, we've got a mixture um, of different archetypes um, and different uses. 39% um, of them um, are, are flats. 
um, and 61% of them are, are detached and semi-detached houses. But a lot of um, the flats are within the central belt of, of Scotland, um, within our very kind of densely packed uh, urban areas, and, and some of the solutions are not that straightforward. A great deal of, obviously, the tenure is important, um, where we've got local um, housing associations and, and, uh, and local authority homes, um, around 24%. And certainly 76% of them are, are, are private. So that, that kind of difference there has a, a role to play in, in the delivery of, of retrofit. So as I mentioned, a great deal of, of flats, um, Glasgow and Edinburgh having, having a, a large uh, role there to play in terms of, of the, the, the number of them. Um, and certainly the type of, of building and method of construction is also uh, quite important here. Um, where a great deal of them are solid stone walls um, and tenements, uh, flatted accommodation. Um, a lot of them untreated with very um, kind of large challenges around how to deal with that. Um, and obviously uh, the energy performance of them um, distinguishes there itself in, on, on how you deal with them. So on to some of the challenges that we're facing, certainly with a lot of the, the local uh, authority homes and, and kind of social housing is we're coming across um, problems, uh, social problems around the cost of living crisis that, that we're living, um, a lot of the, the, the cost inflation uh, around uh, materials and, and delivery of, of, of work, um, inflation around the, the rent increases uh, that has an, an effect on that. Um, and obviously trying to maintain these homes um, and, and have that the long lasting uh, use of them is, is also important. We're trying to keep the quality and um, we have some quality levels uh, that have to be met in, in social housing, certainly. Um, trying to keep that compliance, so both on the existing side, but also new builds and, and, and trying to be as, as, as best performing as possible. And also looking into some of the legislation that we have on social housing, energy efficiency, um, and trying to meet those those metrics is 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 a, is a bit of a challenge, uh, because technically it can't it's not that straightforward. And looking not only in the next uh, couple of years, but also looking at ahead uh, at planning on the delivery of this work is really important, so that we can meet that net zero agenda. But I think some more technical challenges uh, that we're facing is how to balance that social. Um, uh, uh, aspect, uh, the use of the buildings with the environmental uh, targets and, and, and certainly lowering uh, energy use, etc. So that becomes quite, quite a, it's not that straightforward, um, decanting being one of the issues, um, displacing people from their homes to do some of the work is not that straightforward. So that kind of brings um, some other kind of ones, I'm not going to go over them all, but um, for example, fabric uh, interventions versus technology. Um, some people believe that we should be doing just uh, the fabric and improving the fabric. Some go for the more technical, technological kind of uh, uh, solutions uh, with, with low carbon heat. Uh, but I think there needs to be a balance between that. Um, but certainly caring and, and conserving some of the heritage buildings is, is also important and trying to put that at the helm of, of the delivery of the work. Um, and trying to agree some of the methods and some of the consensus around uh, defining archetypes and looking at, at more uh, straightforward uh, uh, delivery mechanisms of, 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 of retrofit um, as an archetype approach is certainly something we're working on. So part of this really builds upon some of the past work that we've been doing around building performance. We're work, we've been working very strongly with uh, Historic Environment Scotland which really are one of the guardians of a lot of the, the historic buildings that we have here in, in, in Scotland, not just important uh, kind of uh, uh, buildings that we have across our cities, but also with the more traditional builds that we have. And that's where a lot of the research that we've been doing um, and past research I've been doing, um, linking in building performance evaluation, looking at pilot studies, the implementation of methods of construction and methods of, in, of retrofit are really important and really creating this technical guidance, which I think is uh, can be applied and used by different levels of, 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 of occupants. We've been doing research around uh, the applicability of different me insulation methods and, uh, and techniques as well. So one of the issues that we're facing is how do we actually deliver 
um, the retrofit. We've got a wide range um, of, 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 of building types, but I think categorizing and having uh, a, a, a similar approach dependent on the archetype, on the type of, 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 of method of construction of these. So you'll have buildings that are uh, solid walled, you'll have cavity walls, etc. So there's, there's that delivery framework that's actually important. And social housing plays a big part in that. The work that's been delivered uh, certainly by Professor Sean Smith around uh, the delivery mechanism of this is, is really important. And part of this has been a ZEST report, which looks at how do we actually do that mass retrofit uh, delivery of homes? How do we reach that net zero targets um, within our uh, housing? And certainly if, if there's an opportunity by, 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 for you to, to, to look at these links and, and these documents, it's really important how it's not just a technical problem, it's also a social and a skills kind of delivery program. Uh, that we deliver. So the approach really tries to blend in the fabric interventions that we should be looking at and, and we should be kind of delivering as a mass but also not forgetting that energy system that should be uh, applicable to the building type um, and having that kind of whole system approach where we've got both working in, in, in interaction. Um, and some of the kind of uh, main categories and, uh, and, and ways that we're doing this is by working with the past publications, trying to gather the evidence, trying to be really concise on what's been, been working in the past and, and how it can be used. Uh, but also focusing on the construction types and the method of construction, the stone builds, the bricks, the cavities, etc., and then also adding some of the distinctions around um, the, the energy uh, uh, kind of values, the interventions that are applicable, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and be, being very kind of uh, realistic on some of the variances that could be approached. Um, so there could be dormer windows, there could be basements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all working around some of the targets in terms of energy efficiency and being very specific on what works in what in some archetypes um, and in others and, and, and trying to be um, delivering this in a mass way. Um, but I think some of the distinctions could be quite simple. Um, it could be that you've got bay windows, it could be that you've got uh, courtyards, etc. But essentially the method of construction might be very similar. So they could be uh, clustering and delivering these solutions quite quite easily. So we've been working on, on how this actually would work uh, in practice, um, working with a lot of our stakeholders, but essentially working with that uh, um, existing uh, studies uh, done before, but also understanding that um, there's different players out there um, where you've got some of the considerations, you've got solutions as well um, that uh, depend a lot on this available skills, on the materials, etc but also how it could be validated through um, a group of technical kind of uh, aware uh, uh, members of, of, of this kind of archetype approach, but also linking in some of the distinctions around low carbon heat, et cetera. Um, so we're working very closely with uh, not just fabric interventions, but also some of the technical kind of uh, low carbon heat uh, systems um, and, and working with local authorities and, and some of the energy providers is also helpful. So hopefully this is a way forward to, to actually preserving a lot of our built heritage. Um, first of all, looking at fabric first approaches, looking at very technical elements around insulation, uh, improving air tightness, thermal bridging, ventilation, and some of the kind of uh, delivery of, of, of energy. Um, but also recognizing that this is, is not a straightforward and, and there needs to be obviously a step change approach. Um, and hopefully this architect approach does that. And finally, just wanted to, to kind of touch on some of the work that we're doing um, in terms of um, uh, technical delivery of, of and, and trying to reach net zero. Um, I'm, I'm working very closely with, with the City of Edinburgh Council, with the Edinburgh Home Demonstrator. Um, there's a, an interesting website there on, on, on kind of how we deliver net zero in a new build uh, perspective. Um, we're developing also work around homegrown uh, wood fibre. Currently, a lot of the UK wood fibre and natural fibres comes from mainland Europe. So we're trying to look at ways in which we can use our own timber to develop that or other fibres as well. Um, and finally, we're, we're developing the archetype approach through a series of workshops um, trying to bring in the stakeholders and discussing 
uh, not just domestic but non-domestic delivery of, of, of this scheme. And 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 really that's 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 it in terms of the work that we're doing and, and, and the, the archetype approach. Please get in touch if you want to talk about this further, but I uh, am happy to share any of the work that we're doing and some of the, the, the kind of findings that we've had so far. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Dario. Okay, I, we're a little bit short in time, so I might just wrap it up. So I suppose, um, yeah, so thanks to our three speakers today. Um, Okay, yeah, so thanks for our three speakers today. So Helena McCallum, um, uh, Nessa Cronin and Julio Bross Williamson for their very uh, insightful talks today. Um, this was a the last talk in the in the webinar series from Construct Innovate and Sustainability Planning and Construction. Uh, those are the seven different topics that were covered. Um, you will find each of those present each of those um recordings up on on youtube if you find uh, if you look up the um construct innovate webinar series you'll find those uh, those talks and the one from today will be up online as well soon afterwards but don't worry we'll move on to a new webinar series starting from next week uh, so our webinar series next week is around digital technologies in construction um in there so we've got um six weeks of uh, of talks starting with digital adoption in construction industry and moving then through digital platforms, AI, virtual augmented reality, digital project delivery, uh, simulation for better performance, and digital buildings and communities. So next week is the first one, which is on digital adoption in construction industry. Uh, we'll have uh, Louise Foody, um, from, who's the Managing Director of Covolve, uh, who's going to talk about a new digital accelerator. So there's a, a phone there available as an accelerator for digital projects within construction. Ralph Montagu, um, who's director of ArcDoc, will talk about pillars of digital transformation. Uh, and Casey Rutland, who's chair of Building Smart UK and Ireland, uh, will talk about driving the digital transformation of the built asset industry. Um, so you will get um, all attendees today will get an email uh, with a direct link in for booking on to the next webinar. Then. So just to again thank all our, our presenters um, today and to thank you for attending again. So uh, enjoy the rest of the day.